You authorized mobilizing the DC National Guard. Welcome to the Military Times Reporters Roundtable, where we bring you the news behind the biggest headlines each week. I'm Leo Shane, Capitol Hill reporter for Military Times, and I have with me a panel of experts to give us insight on the top stories. With me today are Megan Myers, our Pentagon Bureau Chief, Howard Altman, our Managing Editor, and Andrew Tillman, our Executive Editor. Thank you guys all for joining us. Megan, it's been about four months since the attack on the Capitol as Congress tried to certify the presidential election results, but there's still a lot of unanswered questions about the military's response to that event. Former Acting Secretary of Defense Christopher Miller was on Capitol, uh, on Capitol Hill testifying just a few days ago about the delay in sending guard troops. Give us a rundown of, of what was discussed and, and what the latest status is there. So Miller hewed very closely to the official timeline that DOD put out in the few days after January 6th, um, a lot of the lawmaker questions were about that timeline, were about when he realized that the Capitol had been overrun, uh, when he got a request for backup, uh, and when he actually approved that request. So according to that timeline, it was about an hour and a half between when uh, the Capitol Hill police let him know that they needed National Guard help um, and him making the order to mobilize the entire DC National Guard. It then of course took them until about between five and 6 p.m. to actually show up on the Capitol grounds. Um, and lawmakers were really trying to understand why that decision-making process took so long. So Miller answered some questions about um, his thinking on that day and then the planning leading up to it. Uh, but he also made a really big statement about how some of the criticism of the way that the Pentagon responded to or planned um, for the what was supposed to be a rally on January 6th really belies uh, a lack of understanding about how the military plans for things, what their role is in law enforcement and in keeping the peace domestically, um, and how long it takes to mobilize thousands of troops and to come up with a plan of action on the fly the way that they did that day. All right, so let's shift from troops on Capitol Hill to troops in Afghanistan. Lately, there's been a lot of reports about the continued withdrawal of troops from there. All U.S. troops are supposed to be out by September 11th, but still a lot of questions. Megan, what can you tell us about where that stands right now? So as of CENTCOM's update today about the drawdown, they are between 13 and 20 percent complete with the full drawdown. But... CENTCOM has very purposely not been releasing any troop numbers. Um, we know as of January, there were 2,500 conventional forces um, and about 800 more special operations forces. Some rangers were sent in to do extra security at the beginning of uh, the drawdown. So there could be as many as three to 4,000 troops there right now, uh, but we really don't know. One of the other big lingering questions that we keep hearing from lawmakers is what's going to happen to all of those Afghan, Afghan allies who get left behind, all these interpreters, these support staff, and their families. Andrew, I know this has been an issue for years, but it seems like the concern level is very high that these folks are going to be in danger. Yeah, I think it is very high, and uh, for two reasons. One, I think you have a whole generation of uh, military service members that have some really you know, deep ties and and, and real uh, long-term relationships with uh, Afghans that have really helped them out in, in many ways over the years. And I also think that the situation in Afghanistan is um, a little more dire. I think the threat is much greater than when we left, uh, for example, Iraq in, in 2011. I think that the um, risk and concern that there's going to be a really kind of, um, you know, period of, of, of violence and, and score settling and vendettas um, playing out over the next, you know, year or so after U.S. troops leave, um, I think that th that that's a, a much higher uh, risk that, than it was in Iraq. And I want to go back to that level of violence in a second. But Howard, I know you've talked to some of these families and some troops who have uh, close connections to some of these these Afghan allies. What, I mean, what are you hearing from them right now? Well, there's a great deal of concern. I would say several times a month I get a frantic messages on signal from an Afghan interpreter who cannot get into this country. There's a waiting list of uh, about 18,000 um, interpreters from Afghanistan, people who've helped us. The uh, people I've talked to, the, the troops that have worked closely with the interpreters and the interpreters themselves are, are very concerned for the family members and those left behind because the Taliban has already threatened family members, threatened them, threatened to kill them for working with the U.S. And, and the concern is once the Taliban uh, takes power in Afghanistan, retribution will become a way of life. 
Well, and as that violence ramps up, you know, there's a lot of concern about the the rise of terrorist groups again. So, you know, the rise of ISIS in there. Andrew, what I mean, what can we expect if troops aren't on the ground? Can can the U.S. military really fight terrorism in Afghanistan? Well, I think that's uh, certainly a, a big question uh, that a lot of people at the Pentagon are asking. I think the Air Force is certainly preparing to continue uh, conducting some ISR flights over Afghanistan. If they need to, they're prepared to do some um, airstrikes. But I think the real issue is going to be the intelligence. You know, um, you have to know what you're looking at or, or what you're, you're targeting in order for it to be successful. And while we certainly know a lot of people in Afghanistan over uh, after all these years, I think we don't know where those people are going to be uh, after we leave. Are they going to be in a position to, to, to know what's going on and to help us or you know, amid all of the, the chaos that may ensue after we leave, are they going to be not available for whatever the reason? Well, it's something we'll be keeping a close eye on. You can read all of our stories at militarytimes.com. want to thank my panel for their insights today and thank all of you for watching. We'll see you next time.